Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning. My name is Adrian. I am alcoholic. Hi, Adrian. <sighs> Uh, let's see, my sobriety date is October 29th, 1984. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, while we get, you know, I'm feeling good and you all like me. Uh, my, my birthday was, my belly button birthday was September 2nd and I was 60 years old on September 2nd. Let's see. Home group, the Spring Creek Group of Alcoholics Anonymous in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> and uh, let's see. Um, first of all, thank you, Anne, the committee, Lee, uh, for the invitation to come to be with you this weekend. What an incredible weekend. And yes, I am not that spiritually fit that after each speaker this whole weekend, I went, damn. Yeah. Okay, another one. Okay. So I would just like to, uh, I mean, Joy, Mildred, Jane, Terry, the long timers panel, all the participants, and what, what women of integrity, uh, my sisters, Carmen, uh, you all, this has been, it's just been incredible. Um, I was sharing at the, uh, what was we at the sunrise meeting this morning, and, um, and Mildred at the workshop yesterday, uh, back in the day, there was a song by Roberta Flack called Killing Me Softly with his song. <laughs> and, you know, I think that it says he spoke as if he knew me. And she was just killing me softly in that workshop. Um, she, uh, I had to look at some things, you know, I had to look at some things. Am I approachable? You know, what can I be, what can I do to be more approachable? Uh, yeah, a day at a time, it has gotten better for me, uh, and then things have happened, and, uh, trying to be and trying to not be and the boundaries and the friends. My sponsor reminds me constantly that friends are for seasons and some are longer than others. And when those that, and you can't make new friends unless some of the old friends go away. Uh, yeah, there'd be no space for them, she tells me. Yeah, I am sponsored. My sponsor name is Hermina. She's a member of the Stepping Stones group in the Bronx, New York. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I, you know, I was feeling a little bit, you, you made such wonderful comments about people giving up their time to come and be with you this weekend. Well, uh, I am here also because I, I work for the General Service Office of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, yeah. Now, who would have thunk about that one? Um and uh, I was speaking somewhere, and, and Lee approached me, and, you know, I, I still, you know, don't know when the party is supposed to stop. So, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you want, what do you want me to do? How fast? How quick? And, um, you know, but I do check my calendar. And, uh, and so uh, my sponsor has told me over the years that whenever I speak, part of my story is, my work at the General Service Office in New York. We're located at 475 Riverside Drive, right behind Barnard uh, College, and uh, across the street from Riverside Church. If you're ever in New York, and I know some of you go up there occasionally, please come by. You can get a tour. It doesn't have to be prearranged. And you get to see what your dollar or more in the basket uh, does. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous, we have about 80 employees. We are all paid. There are no volunteers in our office. Of the approximately 80 employees, 11 are what we call uh, special workers. If you want to know more about us, read the Ape Tradition, that little homework. And, uh, and we're hired. We have to be recovering alcoholics and members of Alcoholics Anonymous. We have to have at least six years of sobriety and able to communicate. Um, <laughs> Um, 
I, it's a uh, it, it's a job like no other. I can I can share with you that. I I remember when I went for the interview when they called me for the interview, and you are actually interviewed by each staff member, and there were ten of them at the time, and you get fifteen minutes with each of them, and then. We call it going the gauntlet, you know, and they, somebody walks you to the next room as well as the general manager, and then it was the director of uh, staff services, too. And after, uh, somewhere in the middle of that, you go to lunch and you tell your story. Now, I was like, well, I never thought I'd be telling my story to get a job. Yeah. Well, um, uh, at, uh, you know, what we do is we provide services for the groups, and I love hearing all, so many of you talk about your, your home groups and, your, and what you do there, uh, because you can't find a, a, and I will put in always my plug for central offices or intergroups, because that's the first place you call, you know, how do you find a group? And I mean, there's no group people all lined up on the highway saying find the AA group here. Usually someone looks in a phone book or says call the central office, get a meeting list. Now we're all computer savvy, so we go on smartphones and we look up AA and somehow we get connected with data that will tell us where the nearest AA group is. And, uh, and, and when you're a group, you don't have to con contribute to GSO, although it would be helpful, um, to get the services. That's not a requirement. I think uh, less than uh, about maybe half of the groups do, but that doesn't mean that if you write us and say you're a new group, you get the new group packet. You get the handbook. You get everything you need to start and hopefully maintain a healthy group of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, you get the monthly updates, our, our newsletters, let you know what's going on, and connect you with AA as a whole. Because believe it or not, when I came to AA, I thought my group was it. That was it. I didn't care about nothing else, you know. I'm, I, I mean, I could barely care about the discussion about the paper cups during the business meetings, but, you know. But as I kept coming, I began to see that we are connected. We are connected as a whole. So at the office, we have uh, 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 these staff members, which I am one of. I am currently on the cooperation with the professional community. Uh, that's the, the CPC assignment. And basically what we do, we rely on the local AA members because you know what your needs are. Our purpose is to let professionals know, and they often are the ones that come in contact with us either from uh, jails, hospitals, um, uh, um, uh, teachers, uh, ministers, clergy. I heard a lot of, heard all kinds of things this weekend. And they come in contact with the still sick and suffering alcoholic. So what AA does is we just provide information so that when they do come in contact with someone who is like me, they know what to do. They know how to find us. They know what we do, and they know what we don't do. And uh, so I, I love working on the CPC assignment. Uh, that was my first assignment when I started working at GSO in 1996. Uh, and it'll be, and I don't know, I keep saying it, and I just have to see what uh, God, if he's going to change the plan. But at this point, I am going to be leaving GSO after this rotation, uh, taking, I'll, I'll be 62, can take early retirement. And that's the person that didn't think they outlived their mother. And my mother died at 35. So um, it's, it's, it's a miracle. And we have other desks with public information, corrections, treatment, special needs, accessibilities, literature. We have the conference coordinator, and that's the annual business meeting where I hope your GSRs from your groups go to your district meetings and assemblies and report back to you. And if your group is anything like my group used to be, we really didn't want to hear a lot of that. So she had to talk real fast, you know. And then when I became the GSR, I would just say one thing, and they would want to know, well, wait a minute, we didn't send you all the way over there for just one thing. You know, keep them going, keep them being interested. Um, the, then we have uh, the international assignment, and that's our overseas desk, where we work with and provide information and see how we can assist other uh, offices in other, uh, in other countries. There are about 56 GSOs around the world. We are not it, as self-centered as I'd like to think we are. Um, we, we, we might be the first, but there are over, I believe, 10 GSOs that are over 50 years old. 
And offhand, I can think of the UK, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Brazil, uh, South Africa. So we get, um, sometimes we kind of think we're, you know, but AA is, thank God, all over the world. And many, and our big book now is published in over 60 languages. The most recent language, I think, uh, one of them is Hosa. And I cannot do that sound, which is the language of Mr. Nelson Mandela in South Africa and, um, and Zulu. And uh, so we are uh, providing the message wherever, hopefully, the alcoholic is, no matter what language they may speak. We also have regional forums. Regional forums are when we take our pony, our dog and pony show on the road. We come to your region, we bring the general manager, a staff member, the chair of the general service board, we throw in a regional trustee, and uh, the editor, executive, I don't know what she's called now, executive editor, publisher of the Grapevine magazine, which is Amy Brophy, and we, we come to you for a weekend so you can ask all the questions you ever wanted to ask probably find out more information that you care to know about what is going on in AA. It's a free weekend. There's no registration fee, um, and there's no banquet either, but um, <laughs> but, it's, it's, and, but you really get to ask all, all kinds of questions. You, know, you get to just ask a basket in case you don't want to get up to the mic. And I, I fell in love with, with service from going to a forum because I, I'm also nosy by nature. And um, next Southeast Regional Forum, that's your region, will be in Boca, I believe. And see, now you'll have to investigate to make sure I'm telling you the truth. Uh, I heard it's in the even years. So check your websites, and uh, I think it's in uh, 2012, I understand. So hopefully you'll get there and maybe try to stump the general manager. Uh, we, you know, it's a remarkable experience working at the General Service Office, and it's been an honor uh, to be there. I work with 11 staff members, and that's what we're called. Uh, and some of you have met some of us, uh, hopefully, if you've been at your assemblies or different events. And um, <laughs> they are incredible. I, I, you know, now, now they tease me a lot, too, because I, I ride them hard sometimes, you know. Uh, but um, we are all different, and we have very different personalities. Uh, but what I can assure you is that each one of them are committed to doing the work that needs to be done to make sure you have what you need to carry the message. You know, and um, so how did I get there? Um, our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what we are like now. And um, I was born in Harlem. Uh, I was recently in Philadelphia, and in the train station there's a, there was a huge uh, photo uh, display of the migration of the Negro from uh, the South to the North back in the 1930s. And I felt so proud that um, my grandfather was one of those, and then his brothers, and then other brothers, and, um, and, and, and to find a new life for, for our family. And now we're about, about, I think, six or seven generations now. Um, so I grew up in Harlem. Let's see, let's see, my mother and my mom, they, they were married. My mother and father married. Now, the way the story goes is that they moved, they had their own place. He got drunk. She hit him in the head with the frying pan. And then she moved back with my grandmother. And that's where we lived till I was about 14 years old. So it was me, my mother, my grandmother, and my grandfather. It was all about me. Uh, you know, that was one thing that wasn't too difficult for me when I came here to you all. I kind of knew that there was something about me that always felt that it was all about me. Um, <laughs> my mother worked every day. And she partied on the weekends. My grandfather worked on the New Haven Railroad. He was a cook, the New York to Boston run. And, you know, I remember when I first started sharing, I would say, yeah, the New York to Boston run, and he came home once a week, da, 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 da. And then one time I was like, well, wait a minute. Why did he only come home once a week? 
from New York to Boston is not that far. No. But, um, but then there was Nick. Nick was my grandmother, and uh, I guess he could only take her once a week. Um, <laughs> And I want to be just like my grandmother. My grandmother was a bad mamma jamma before there was mamma jamma. Um, she was rough. You didn't, and she wasn't a big woman either, but you didn't mess with her. I remember one time my father was over at the house and, you know, he would, yeah, my father was a wonderful man. He worked for the post office. Eventually he lost his job at the post office for drinking. So, you know, he kind of drank an awful lot back in those days because they didn't really fire you at the post office. They let you, they let you drink yourself to death. And, um, <laughs> And so, but, you know, those were before the real bad days for him. And But he would listen to, you know, he drank, and then he'd hear, you know, listen to music. Then he'd become Frank Sinatra, and he'd take the coat and throw it over his shoulder and put his hat on. And my grandmother had no tolerance for nonsense, and so, um, and she told him he had to leave. He couldn't be acting. I don't know what she had. Maybe she didn't like Frank Sinatra. But um, she she told him he had to leave, and, and I guess she had had a few too many that night too and decided that he wasn't going to leave through the front door he had to leave through the fire escape so i remember my father kind of looking a little nervous going out the fire escape with his hat and his coat um but that's how my grandma my there were some things and i'll share this with you about my personality as a child some of, some of the things that i heard them say to me was adrian the world does not revolve around you Adrian, you walk around like the world owes you a living. Adrian, you can't have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> now, I thought that last one was very interesting, but uh, that's a discussion for another fellowship. <laughs> yeah. so, so this was how I was before I picked up a drink. Now, add in the fact that they told me that I was average. I was, no, I was better than the average bear. I was highly intelligent. I had a high IQ. I had potential. The dreaded potential. <laughs> Somewhere in my mind, that said, well, if I know I'm, I got it, you know I got it, why do I have to do anything? <laughs> um, so that all this was, was part of this personality of this kid that was growing up. And I also I was born with one other thing too. I I choose to, if I think I was born with alcoholism and was just waiting to pour alcohol on it. I was born with knowing everything. Don't know how I got it. <laughs> just lucky I guess. Um and I, I really don't know and you know, and it can become a burden too, knowing everything. You know, and, and and people would ask you things, and you know, and I just felt the need to give to t respond. And then somewhere along the line, very early, I realized it's obviously you didn't know if you were asking me, so I could make it up. And um, so these were the tools for life I merrily walked into uh, maturity with. Uh, so, so finally, uh, when I was around 15 years old, my mother died, and uh, when I was 16 years old, my grandmother died. Yeah, that's what I said. Um, but you know that's not why I'm an alcoholic. Okay, we all know that, the book, obsession, mental obsession, physical compulsion, that's why I'm an alcoholic. Tragedies happen to a whole bunch of folks, and they're not sitting next to me in this room. Um, you know, but because of who I am and my chemical makeup and my uh, and my body that says when I taste that first one, that's all, all bets are off. I'm alcoholic. Um, my mother had one sibling who's my who's my uncle, and um, uh, we were very close too. And uh, so after she when she died, he saw her before she died, and she had said that. You know, Adrian is going to go live with, you know, to be with you and your wife. And they had two children. So I went from the world being all around, you know, all about me. My grandmother ironed my underwear, you know. 
she would say things like, what do you want for, oh, I go into the food thing again. What do you want for dinner, Adrian? You know, you want pancakes? Well, I'll make pancakes for Adrian. You know, you're going up to your, your, uncle's, your, your uncle's house, and that was her son. You better take some food, because they never have enough food up there for you. <laughs> oh, I better go. Beverly, I got to go to the other thing. Um, so, um, oh, now, okay. Now, let's remember where I was at. Now, where I was at was, was at going to my uncle's house, right, uh, to live. But, okay, now I got to stop there. You all hold me there. I have to thank the young lady that picked me up at the airport. Uh, okay. Mm. Um, I met her. Jeez, about 23, 20, almost 24 years ago. She had 11 days. And um, I had the privilege of sponsoring her. And then she moved to Florida. <laughs> yeah. Making room for new friends to replace the space for old friends that are moving on. <laughs> uh, we, we have stayed in touch over the years and... Um, She'll always be my sponsee, but she's become a friend. And um, thank you, Beverly, for picking me up and taking me back to the airport. <laughs> now, I, I will share that we had a little crisis. And when I picked up the phone and I heard her crying, I couldn't breathe. Uh -uh. And, but you know, when you respond to people, you gotta sound kinda grown up. <laughs> Cause I mean, how helpful would I have been? It was like, oh, damn, Sally! <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, I'm trying to hold it together. I said, Bev, what's wrong? <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm about to lay out in my office, I'm on the floor. You know, so, you know, we, we, we you know, she talked, I listened, she cried, I listened, and, um, I hope I made some sense and did said they're all the right things, you know, because that's what we're supposed to do, you know. Then when I got off the phone, you know, I can tell my growth because um, probably 10 years ago I would have been on the plane. I'm going to find someone to give me a gun. I'm going to straighten it out, you know. I don't know. You know I'm going down there. Who do your hand on the hip? Who do they think? You know. And then the neck going. You know. That's mine, you know. Oh, sucky, sucky, earrings off, you know. But, but I didn't do that, did I? I was so nice, so nice. And um, and I tell you, and I'm so proud of her because she did what it was so hard for me to to tell her to do and suggest that when she moved here, she had to get another sponsor. She had to meet women. She had to, you know, get her network, and uh, she did that. And uh, and I think that kept her from murder. But anyway, <laughs> so, but we're still here. We're still standing. We're okay. Um, uh, and I love you, Beverly. Uh, so now, where was I? Oh, you know I love you, my sisters. <laughs> So I go to live with them, and they they trying to be normal, all right? So I had to have responsibilities, you know, duties. I'm thinking, I'm not the mother. Why I got to do all this stuff? I'm thinking that, and I'm sure the attitude showed. Um, I, I felt like there was an imposition on me, you know. Just because she worked every day, why do I have to cook? They're not my children. You know? I remember thinking this stuff, you know. And so I will say to you that my aunt and I did not have a great relationship. And what, and it was, and as I grew up, I, I began to understand that she was only 15 years older than me. So I came to her at 15 or 16. She was like 30, 31, and I was this monster. I was this child that my grandmother had created that walked around like the world owed, you know, me a living, a, a sense of entitlement. So we didn't have such a great relationship. And so I decided that when, my way of getting out was because I was intelligent, uh, I was going to go to college. And I remember thinking, somebody said, well, what, what are you going to college for? And I was like, I don't know, I'm just, I'm smart. <laughs> yeah, that, that's why I'm going to college. I went to college in the infamous days of 1969. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And if I thought I was entitled to stuff, I knew I was entitled to stuff. 
I mean, just say Dr. King was assassinated. Oh, that meant they let me through the line. You know, everybody's filled with guilt, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I learned how. To, I heard somebody that they were good at manipulating. I don't know about good, but people were good at feeling guilty. And, um, and I mean, so I, I went through this college thing. But that's where I picked up alcohol. I mean, I had tasted it before, was not impressed. You know, it made you all act very stupid when you drink. Um, but, um, and, and I saw my grandfather and his brothers, they used to, you know, start getting the taste, as they call it. And then uh, somebody would bring up something that happened back down south 20 years ago. And then somebody else would bring it up, and they start fighting and arguing, cussing. Then they crying and singing spirituals. So... <laughs> So I saw that, and I was like, I was never going to be like that. Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and because I told you how brilliant I, I, I was, I also, when you're brilliant, you have to make these proclamations. I heard somebody say this over the weekend. You have to tell people the, your insight on life because it's just so brilliant. And I, I, and I remember telling people that I was never going to drink alcohol. I was not going to smoke cigarettes. And I was not going to have sex before I got married. Well, we women here, so I can tell. Um, because usually I, now, well, um, I'm a woman and I'm an alcoholic, okay, and all that that comes with it, you know. And, um, and I mean, it was some stuff, too, that came with it. So, but, it, and of course, what I, what I look back at my story and I see some of the things about being different, See, see, you all act this stupid when you drink, but I just acted more better, more intelligent. <laughs> I really had insights when I began to drink. The answers came to me, see, if you let them, you know, and I could help you, and I would fix you, and I would, oh, it was just a wonderful state for about five minutes. When I, would, when I took that drink it was, uh, and made that connection that day at my surprise birthday party all about me, I was 18, I got taller. I got slimmer. I didn't need glasses for about five minutes. <laughs> and I remember thinking, what were you waiting for? What were you waiting for? I mean, this is it. This is it. And I was to, I was to chase that feeling for 15 years. My story is one of progression. If not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here. Uh, it got worse. I wouldn't be here. If I could still go like I was in them early days, I probably wouldn't be here. But I'm alcoholic, and my alcohol, alcoholism wasn't like that for me. Uh, I, uh, I did graduate from college um, because a God of my understanding did give me some abilities, uh, but it did take me five to make four. And... Uh, and I picked up some other substances, uh, bec uh, you know, uh, just through the journey there. Um, and then I put them down. Uh, I came back to New York. I went to school in, in Binghamton, New York. And, uh, uh, and I came back to New York City. And uh, I went back to my aunt and uncle, and that lasted about 30 minutes. She was like, there's only room for one woman in this house. <laughs> and you ain't it. And so... Um, <laughs> Went to live with my grandfather and uh, got a bank, I mean, got a job at a, a, a major financial institution, back office, money market division, Fed funds. Yeah. Well, the bank is no longer in existence, but it's not my fault. <laughs> but I, I, I did work there for 11 years, and, uh, and that's where my drinking just took off. Um, it was it was brutal. It was what it what it was, uh, and I'm glad it's what it was because um, I didn't miss too much. Yeah, I, I love people talking about top shelf, bottom shelf, I, no shelf. You know, I was I, I I did them all, and then again I then I picked up some other substances again because I was desperate and I believed a lot that if I picked up those substances, it would keep me from getting as drunk as I was getting. So then I became the wide awake drunk lunatic. Um, I know some people want to knock me out for sure. Um, so it, uh, finally, my job said, um, 
you know, I, I you know, I look at my, of my, at my alcoholism and, you know, in the beginning it was party, drink, party, go home, jump in the shower, go to work, you know, then it was party, go home, don't jump in the shower, go to work, and then it was don't shower, don't go to work, you know. Um, I was not somebody that, you know, had this great work record and, you know, sitting on the side of the bed making that call. Uh, no, I, I, I won't be in today. <laughs> I'm not, you know, and I had to fit, you know, whenever I lie, I got to have a little bit of truth because that makes the lie better. And the great thing about it was, you know, only an alcoholic would think the great thing about something would be that you had a hangover. I got, I had horrible hangovers. So it wasn't difficult to sound sick on the phone. And, um, I mean, and and, you're, and I never found a cure for the hangover either. What was what was interesting, if I was at your house, because I also had a habit of not going home either, you know, <laughs> the party would, I'd be there and everybody left and you're looking around, I'm still sitting in the corner somewhere sleeping. And um, and then I'd try to get myself together, I'd go in your bathroom, look in your medicine cabinet and see what does not, do not take or operate machinery. <laughs> Or it'll make you drowsy. That's what I took. Um, yeah. And, you know, by the end of my drinking, um, I had become everything. Because, again, you know, I'm brilliant and I have to make pronouncements about life and how I see it. And I could not stand a crying, repeating yourself, pissy drunk. I couldn't stand those people. You know, we had some in my family. The people kept saying, you know who I am? Yes, I know who you are. You know who I am? You know, I'm your uncle. Yeah, I know that's who you are. You know, <laughs> so I couldn't stand those people. And, and my Uncle Sam was the neighbor, my great uncle, my, my grandfather's brother. He was the neighborhood bum that sat on the box, on the corner, you know, and was an alcoholic. So, um, but I had become that. I had become, I mean, I still had a job, barely. Um, I, I developed a bladder problem. It stopped when I stopped drinking, but <laughs> but it, it, I had this problem. And, um, and, you know, and, 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 you know and, and it got to the point where people would say, you know, Adrian, please don't pee up my car. And, <laughs> you know, you know, I, I mean, I, and when people say stuff like that, I mean, I had a college degree. Um, and uh, and it would hurt, you know, but have another drink and I, you know, I'd drink another drink and tell my pee up better cause than theirs and, you know. Oh. Oh, wait a minute. When, when Beverly was newly sober, she used to say to me, do you have to tell that story? I say, yeah, I got to tell that story. Because I don't want to forget because it was all right. It was all right to walk into the Thanksgiving dinner thanking God that it was raining because I done peed on myself trying to walk from the bus stop. And now I'm, and I can still remember how shoes feel when you sliding on the inside the shoe. <laughs> Ladies! Yeah. So I, 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 I don't want to forget that. Um, yeah. And I also don't want to forget, you know, uh, and, and, and some of the ladies I've heard uh, today talk about that too. Um, see, I was I had this persona. I thought I'm cool. Never let them see you sweat. And uh, now I'm crying. I'm getting crying jags. You know, I'm at the party, and all of a sudden I'm just boohooing and not. And I love the, the, the strategic, you know. And I used to do that in AA too. I could, and I was doing it the other day. But I just, you know. But then it gets to the point when you know how it gets, and it's not coming out, and 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 I'm, I'm I got my head in somebody's lap, you know, and and I remember a friend of mine, her name was Heather, and she used to say to me, she said, Adrian, what's wrong? You know, she said, you help everybody else. What's wrong? And I didn't know. And the next day, nobody would mention it, you know. So. Crying, repeating yourself. The blackouts were horrible. You know, in the beginning, I have to tell you, I thought blackouts were a gift too. You know, you you know, you be at the party, yeah, you know. Then you, da da, I'm home. You know, I, I was like, I mean, I didn't have to worry about if I had to get a ride. You know, yeah. It, 
no, I'm home. Everything's good. Yeah. But uh, but what I have is progressive, and it gets worse. And now it's ta-da, but I ain't home. Um, I'm with some of these same other people again. You know, I'm 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 I'm, I'm opening up my pocketbook, and my underwear are in the pocketbook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, you know, and and you know, and you, some of that stuff you had to take another drink after, you know. And, and I had this thing about ham, baked ham. I love baked ham. All right, I'm gonna go baked ham. And I guess I would go to the party and put it in my pocketbook. And so a month later, there's a big red dinner napkin. And a pair of drawers, I saw. I don't know. Well, that hasn't happened to me since I've been in AA either. So, so all right, all right. So, and this was the fun I was giving up when I came to your, you know. I mean, when I, I finally, uh, I had, in August of 1984, there was an employee assistant, there was a, 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 some, a, a, some kind of health fair day, and the EAP, thank you, thank you, the EAP was there, and uh, of course, my grandmother told me years ago that I didn't need nobody, I didn't have to depend upon anybody, if you depend upon them, they will leave you, so you don't need nobody. And so you don't hear much about God in my story at all. I thank God he didn't care whether I acknowledge it or not. He was working in my life. And um, so you don't hear about it. Now, I would certainly refer you to one, you know, to the nearest mosque, synagogue, the Bible. It would be helpful to you. But, you know, I wasn't doing it. However, to be on the safe side, I, ain't talk too, I wouldn't talk too bad about it either, just in case. Um, but it's a hard way to live. That's a hard way to live. Um, you wake up one day and, you know, and, and, and I had all the answers all the time. And I could, you know, I was going to fix it. I could figure it out. And my progression led me to the point where I couldn't figure stuff out anymore. And I'd be sitting there and, and, and I just didn't know what had happened. Um, I, I, I went to that health fair and I made an appointment with that employee assistance program guy. And, um, he asked me a few questions and uh, about my drinking, and I lied, and he gave me a book on women and alcoholism. I flipped through that book. My grandmother did not raise an alcoholic. I was too intelligent to be an alcoholic. Um, my problem was that there, I didn't have a master's degree. My problem was that my job didn't appreciate me. My problem was there were no decent men left in America. <laughs> Those were our problems. But but I looked through the book and and it, and it's so strange. It was later on when I began to read the big book. But in this book they said, um, well if you don't think you have a problem with alcohol, try to decide a number of drinks you're going to drink on any given night. And if you can stick to that number of drinks, maybe you're not alcoholic. So I, I, I should have known I had a problem because it took me about three days to decide on the number of drinks. <laughs> and the number was eight. <laughs> and I remember being at the bar knowing that I was going to have another drink. And it, and it talks about me in that book, you know, knowing that I had to have another drink. Um, that was like in August of 84, October of 84, another night of I'm not going to. I'm not going to go to the bar. I'm not going to run a tab. I'm not going to. I had adopted some young guys. Uh, they, they were drug dealers, but they called me Ma. It's not a wonderful feeling. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I wasn't going to get anything from my boys. Um, yeah. And I did all of that. You know, and I came to, and I knew I had to go to work because I was on warning for final absentee. If I was late or absent one more time, they were going to fire me. They didn't care I had been there eight years, you know. And my, I want you to know my hours were 11 to 7, and I couldn't get to work at 11 o'clock. 
And it was a setup. You know, I mean, for an alcoholic like me, that's a setup. <laughs> Late or absent, you know. So they were just waiting, you know. They just, and, um, but that day I, I got to work and I got the dirt, I got the cleanest of the dirtiest clothes. Uh, well, I, ke- I kept no food in my house, but you always found Lysol spray and spray starch. Sometimes that could be a little problematic if you pulled out the wrong one. And and I like the slippery shoes. I always remember the smell of using an iron on dirty clothes. I'll never, I never never want to forget that. And so I, I got to work that day. And by then I'm doing the thing where I go to work and I sleep it off in medical, right? And then I come back. I come, you know, I get to work, go to medical, <laughs> go to lunch. So I'm working about two to end at like six. But um, but I go up to medical and um. The uh, God begins to work so that I can see him and I have to give him the credit because um, I get a crying jag. I'm crying at work. Like no crying in baseball. There's no crying at the job. And I'm laying the me- in the minute bed. I'm crying. And it's like a, the cartoon when you watch your life flash before you. And in the, and I could see what it was like when I started drinking. Hey, and now, no money. I get paid on Thursday, broke on Friday. Saturday, I'm trying to take bottles to the store to, to cash in to get a pint of wine, night train, chilled, maybe, maybe not, to fit in my raincoat, in my, in my bathrobe pocket underneath the raincoat, to go home with the karate movie on with no sound, to walk up and down the apartment wondering what had happened to my life. That was the end of my drinking. But when I came to y'all, it was like, oh, I was having a wonderful time. Now I'm condemned to be here with you wonderful people. <laughs> so, and, and, and that's what, and what I saw that day was people had come and gone. They'd gotten married, remarried, done things, and I couldn't figure out what had happened. Uh, the, the doctor came in, and I heard him say, John, do you want to speak to her? She reeks of alcohol. Because that counselor who I had speak, I had uh, met with a couple of months before then, it was, you know how they do in AA, you know, when we tell stories, it was his day off. But he happened to be in the medical department that day. <laughs> and, and he says, John, do you want to speak to her? She reeks of alcohol. And I want to tell him, first of all, I drink vodka and vodka doesn't smell. <laughs> And I guess it wouldn't if you washed every once in a while. Um, I lived alone, and I had seen Psycho, and I wasn't going out like that. So I, because if you live alone, you don't want the water to take a shower, right? So I can't let the water hit my face. So I would put lather up and then put the water to hit me here. And I'd have to spin around real quick just in case somebody came in the shower with a knife. And... And then I kept thinking, if I do that, I'm going to slip and fall. I'm going to be naked, fat, black, laid out in that bathroom. So I just stopped showering, you know. So So when he asked me, you know, and and he came to me and he said, Adrian, are you willing to get some help? And... I I remember thinking that my grandmother told me that um I couldn't depend upon anybody else and that we didn't I didn't need any help. And uh, what came out was yes. What came out was yes. And um again, I, it wasn't my doing and that began my journey. I am so grateful for the treatment program that I went into. Uh it was a Hazleton based treatment program and back in 84 they did the AA model for, you know, it was a, you know, they didn't tell you the AA thing at first. They snuck it up on you. <laughs> yeah. And then they were going like, uh, so Adrian, um, you know, you'll be doing out patients soon. How many meetings a week do you think you can make? <laughs> and I had to think. Oh. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> busy, you know, so busy, busy. And so they said, look, you're going to make five meetings a week. And I said, are you crazy? <laughs> yeah. But then I decided, uh, and this is what part of my personality is, I was going to do whatever they said to do. And then when I got drunk again, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so 
I was told to get us, they said, you know, you got to go to these five meetings, you got to get a sponsor, you got to get a home group, you know, so I, I got all those things. I joined a group in Brooklyn. It was it was my first group for about 10, 11 years, was Old Parks Locating. They, some people call it the Paris Island of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> Um, you know, you, you, they didn't pray. They didn't take no prisoners. I don't know. I guess they'd probably be in jail for some kind of abuse today. Um, yeah, you, know, you know, you'd go in and you'd say, you know, how you doing today? Oh, well, I, you know, I'm okay. Did you drink today? It was like, first of all, why are you yelling? You know, no, I didn't drink today. Well, you had a great day. It was like, you know, you know, I, yeah. But and I, I, thank you, thank you, you know, all right. You know, and and you know, we had about, at that time, we had about 23 meetings a week, and uh, and that was good for me. I was the the, 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 the drunk that, you know, I, I, I went to, and they weren't fancy bars, but, yes, it was everywhere, you know, I went where everybody knew my name. I mean, and I thought it was so wonderful to get phone calls at the bar, you know. Adrian, phone, oh, thank you, you so now I'm in a group, and everybody, you know, I'm in a group where everybody knows my name. And, you know, I tell you, it really, and I remember the day that I was either watching Cheers or I turned from it, and they were singing this song. And, um, and uh, aren't you always glad you came, you know? Don't you want to, where everybody knows your name? Um, yeah, that, 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 that's what they, one of the things that AA has is, is done for me. Um, so I got active. They say, you know, because I tell you, I was going to do the formula so that when it didn't work. Well, as you know, my sobriety date is October 29th, 1984. So I haven't believed the lie that a drink could make anything better. I wish I could tell you that I have not thought of drinking since coming to AA. That's not true. Um, there have been times when, and I know when, I, I can recognize it now, when the stuff hits the fan and it hurts and I can't swallow and I think, boy, I need to breathe. I need to take a drink. And then I share it, and I can swallow, and it gets better. And and you help me walk through it. Um. So, uh, you know, I work at GSO. I stay sober, and oh, I, I did a. I finally decided. I thought, I, what am I gonna be when I grow up? What am I gonna be when I grow up? And I remember Liz Bailey said to me, "You're going to be an alcoholic." <laughs> I love you, Liz. I love you. And um, and then one day I was I was I, I did leave the bank. I went into a social work like career where I was doing social work without the credentials. So I decided I was tired of people throwing buzzwords around, and I might as well get some buzzwords and some letters behind my name too. So I asked my sponsor in about I had ten years, and she said, "Yeah, I think you can go back to school." She says, "Then go to meetings at the same time," and uh, that's what I did. And and one of the ladies shared, "I don't know how I did it. I mean, I." I was active in area. I was, you know, I was CPC chair for my area. I was going to school. I was a supervisor at the, but um, my higher power carried me. Um, and then from there, after working for the city with child abuse and neglect and family preservation, uh, the opportunity came for the general service office. And I went and uh, I got that job and I've been there since 1996. So here we go for the elephant in the room. I woke up uh, one morning. I have a habit of um, getting to work. Somebody tells me if you're on time, you're late. Uh, I have this theory about people, God made early people, God made late people. Uh, my sponsors are early people, you know. If she tells me to meet her at 7.30, I know she's going to be there at 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. Um, I'm going to be there at 7.29, 7.31. And, um, and so, and I still struggle with that at times. And I woke up and I got up for some reason and I was up early. And I'm like, oh, and I start watering the plants, you know, wiping the furniture. And I said, something said, stop, go to work. You know, just go on to work, for, you know, see what it feels like to be there early maybe, you know. And so I stopped and I went to work early. And uh, when I walked in the door of the General Service Office of Alcoholics Anonymous, 
the receptionist said to me, uh, did you hear the plane went into the World Trade Center? And um, I'm standing there, and I'm thinking, oh, that's terrible. What happened? He lost his way? You know, I, um, I should mention that when I come to work, I, I, the train would go right under the World Trade Center. So because I came to work early that day, it might have been a different story. Um, so I was saying, oh, you know, and then they said, another plane is hit. So now I'm getting a little, uh, okay. Then the Pentagon. Well, that was it. I'd like to tell you that um, I held fast to my faith, and I stood there, and I began to gather everybody around and try to I went in my office. I called my aunt, who is my best friend now, and I love her to death. I called her, and I said, I can't pray. I couldn't pray. And um, she said, it's all right. I'll pray for you. And she prayed. And um, she said, I'd like to think that God's hands are there. And as they're leaving those windows, he's catching them. I said, okay, that's all right. That's good. That's good. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> and um, I came out of my office, and everybody, at the time, I think Greg Muth was our general manager. And, you know, I tell you, the higher power is awesome. I couldn't think of no place I could rather be at than the general service of alcohol, general service office of alcoholics and I'm just on a day like that. And uh, he called us into the, the conference room, and I don't know what Greg said, but I knew I felt okay. And then I became part of the plan to how we were going to get people out of there and try to, they were closing the highways. People had kids in schools and, and I did what we do. I did what we do. Um, I got a ride to see my mom. I call her my mom now, actually my aunt. And I saw her face. Then we got to Brooklyn to take me and I went to my, my, my place of worship. And uh, for the next few days, everything was, there was no planes. And I lived right on the pathway to the airport. And I remember doing my walk on the Belt Park Parkway area, and it was so quiet. It was so quiet. And I had, and I was making a plan just in case I'd have to jump off the highway and roll in a ditch or something. You know, it's amazing how your mind goes. <laughs> so... We go back to work, and we were scheduled. We had just rotated assignments, and we were scheduled to go to the Southwest Regional Forum in Albuquerque, New Mexico, September 24th. My mom had decided now that, you know, her key thing, her thing to me was like, I'd never, I've never been to Albuquerque. So that meant she wanted to go with me. You know, she'd do it. I'd never been to Chicago. That means she's going with me to Chicago. So, I, I had, so she was already scheduled to go with me to Albuquerque. What a God. What a God. We got to the airport. I mean, you can imagine what it was like a week, ten days later. And she was with me, my prayer warrior. And, uh, and I had said to Greg, I said, we're not going to Albuquerque, are we? And he was like, Yeah. I'm like, this guy is crazy, you know. Um, but then I, I prayed, and I got all right with it, and um, we got there, and people were stunned. Uh, they couldn't believe that we were there. It was a ghost town, but we had about 400 AAs show up to that forum. We were sent a, a lot of uh, letters and emails, just a, a prayer and thought, and um this was uh, something was sent by uh, one of our past trustees, Greg T, and um, we used it for the forum for the entire cycle for the two years because everybody always wanted to know how are we doing, what were we doing, were we okay. And it, it was written by Bill Wilson, and it first appeared in the January 1962 Grapevine, and it's also in the book Language of the Heart. And it says, we of AA now find ourselves living in a world characterized by destructive fears as never before in history. But in it, we nevertheless see great areas of faith and tremendous aspirations to address justice and brotherhood. Yet no prophet can presume to say whether the world outcome will be a blazing destruction or the beginning 
under God's intention of the brightest era yet known to mankind. I am sure we AAs well comprehend this scene. In microcosm, we have experienced this identical state of terrifying uncertainty, each in his own life. In no sense pridefully, we AAs can say that we do not fear the world outcome, whichever course it may take. This is because we have been enabled to deeply feel and say, we shall fear no evil, thy will, not ours, be done. Thank you for my sobriety. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.